The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. If only fragrance could be part of your viewing experience today. I'm Kristen Stowes, inviting you to take time to smell the roses as I talk with Gary Tharnish of Burton Tyrrell's Flowers. Hi, I'm Jerry Renault. Today on Live and Learn, we have a very special guest. It's Bob Downey from the Capital Humane Society. He's here to talk to you about ways that you can help out the society and also has brought some very cute friends. It's a great segment. Stick around. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and do we have something special for you today? The Angels Theater Company. The local actors, local writers, local performers have created 16 short plays, and you're going to be able to see them this month. So please, stay with us. Hi, I'm Jerry Renault. Today on Live and Learn, you are in for a special treat. Local musician Steve Hansen is going to be here, talk about his career, talk about his life, and he's going to play a song for you. Don't miss it. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Did you know that flowers have a language all their own? I'm Kristen Stowes, and that is the subject for our discussion today, as I welcome Gary Tharnish of Burton Tyrrell's Flowers. Welcome to Live and Learn, Gary. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm thrilled to have you. Good. Let's start by hearing what brought you into this wonderful world of flowers. Uh, well, when I was in high school, my best friend's mom bought a flower shop, and they needed somebody just to deliver after school, water plants, that kind of thing. And I always loved plants. Or if it come from a family, we call it a family of dirt. <laughs> we were always gardening or something. And so um, it, it just started that way. And then okay. I just built into the design part of it. I'm a musician. So the creative oh. end of it was really wonderful. And it just kind of stuck. That all went together and you were destined. Yeah. I think so. Right. <laughs> so you've been in the floral industry for a while now. Um, how has it changed over the years? Oh, it's changed dramatically. You know, business changes anyway. And if you're not cha changing, you're going to be left behind. But our industry has shown a huge amount of change. In the late 70s, when I first started in the business, you didn't have, you know, FedEx, UPS, all the modes of shipping that you have today. Yes. Uh, there obviously was no internet. We were just probably, Lincoln was probably just finally done with party lines, yeah. if you remember those. <laughs> yeah. So back in the Stone Ages. Um, so where we are today compared to that, it's been an immense amount of change. There were no grocery stores, now grocery stores sell flowers all sorts of mass marketers sell mm -hmm. flowers. Um, you can now order flowers. The chain of distribution has been totally changed. Originally, flowers all came from Pikes Peak because uh, so much daylight there. Today, oh. flowers come from Ecuador, Israel, South America. They'll pick them. We'll have them in our door in 48 hours. Wow. So, huge so it has really opened the world to you it for has. flowers. Yes, yes. That's right. Yes, I can understand. So when you start making an arrangement, in addition to making the arrangement appropriate for the occasion, you told me that knowing about the culture of the person receiving the arrangement was so important and I thought that was so interesting I'd never thought about that before let's uh, explain that just a little bit before we get into specifics um, it is very true you um, in you know today we um, have such a mixed society of people from all over the world and so right here in Lincoln Nebraska for example we have cultures from Iran um, you know South America Europe everybody mm -hmm. and so Especially for sympathy flowers, colors and types of flowers can make a big difference and you can really send a wrong message. Uh, so we find ourselves hopping on Google all the time or, <laughs> you know, or Bing something to get our information, which I'm sure listeners do all the time, uh -huh. which is a good way to do that. But you do need to be very careful when you're sending flower, flowers for different cultures. Well, I understand. And we are going to look at five different cultures now. Okay. And we have pictures and this Sounds will good. explain this even more. So our first picture is a beautiful white bouquet, and this is um, appropriate for an Asian culture, yes. correct? Yes, yes, for most Asian cultures. Okay. Um, if they're, you know, Asia, that's a big generalized True. area. True, yes, exactly. But for most Asian cultures, especially Chinese, Japanese, uh, sending flowers for a funeral, colors that are appropriate are whites and yellow. That's very appropriate mm. for a funeral. On the flip side of that, you would never want to send a white arrangement or a white and yellow arrangement for a birthday to someone really? in an Asian culture. Sure, because it symbolizes death, oh, yes. end okay. of life. I understand. Yeah, so you don't want happy birthday, here's your no. <laughs> white plant, hope something bad doesn't happen. I so you understand. want to be very aware of that. And, okay. um, 
you know, there are things appropriate and inappropriate for that sort of an occasion. Mm -hmm. And so it goes over the occasion. So birthday, obviously, not yellow and white. Okay. Other than that, you know, birthdays, anniversary, multicolor, joyous mm -hmm. colors are great, mm -hmm. warm colors and everything, just not okay. for a funeral. All right. Yeah, Very it's a important big one. to know. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Now we have a group of three pictures, and this would be for the Muslim. Muslim culture, excuse me. Yes, and again in the Muslim culture, so that covers a wide area and, and swath of the earth. Sure. Um, and so it'll differ very much from, actually from tribe to tribe or from area to area. But for example, in, in um, Lincoln here, we have a large Iranian population. Okay. And for an Iranian funeral, for example, the warm colors of lavenders and blues and greens, those kind of colors combined together are very, very, very appropriate. Oh. Um, other than that, their flowers will be a lot similar to ours actually, very multicolored, okay. lots of flowers is okay uh, for, the, for the service itself. But sending something to a home, they definitely want the warm colors. Now that would be the exact opposite of you know China, Japan, Korean, and that type of oh, an area. Wow. So you do want to know that when you're sending flowers. And again, that will vary then again from country to country sometimes too. So okay. you're not going to probably find out all of the information, but to just generally know, you want to be thinking of that a little bit. Yes. You know, and not call up your florist and say, you know, my friend's in the hospital. Can you send a white arrangement? And they oh. are from an Asian or Middle you Eastern. You really country. have to ask more questions. We do. Yeah. yeah. You yeah, do. It yeah. is a different world. Yes, so you do want to know it, that. It yeah. is. Absolutely. Sometimes I'll know the questions to ask by the name. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, if it's true. going to a Flakish lady. Okay, okay. I'm probably going to have to find out the culture. So <laughs> To take it a little yeah. further. All right. Now we have a group of pictures. Uh, the country of India is what we're going to be talking about. Well, I love the country of India because uh -huh. I love oh, color. Look at this. I absolutely love color. Oh, so this would be wow. very appropriate for a sympathy in the Indian culture. Really? And oh. in a, a lot of this type of design is called pavain. In other words, there's created pathways of flowers. So you can see the reds, the, the purples, the blues, they all kind of follow a little so path. So is there a form under that? Um, you, we, can, we can't really order a butterfly form. You usually cut it okay. out, of, out of an Oasis product and then design that. So it's very much by eye. But this would be very appropriate in the culture of uh, India for a funeral. Um, another thing you see a lot in India, well, multicolor, vivid, vivid colors are very appropriate in India for all occasions. Okay. So it's kind of the opposite. You'll oh, see a lot of yeah. this where they string flowers together. You see this in their clothing, that type of design. You see repetition a lot in the Indian culture of okay. color and design. Here they will bead flowers together and you'll see the white mums and then there's a green mum and a rose. So you kind of see this in our culture with the Catholic rosary. Oh, we'll make right. those. Sure. In the Indian culture, this isn't necessarily for prayers that they do it, but they just have use a lot of design where it's repetition of color and theme. So you have the white, mm. touch of green, red, white, touch of green, red, and they create that. And then in the next picture, there should be another picture here. Here, you'll see, again, the yellow and white. Yes. So in India, this is also very appropriate for a funeral, but not necessary. So bright colors are fine, but you can okay. send this and the meaning will be understood. Right. Here you see some of the pavane technique I talked about, where the white glads, phoenix up out of the top, but just below that, see the yellow carnations that create I your do. pathway and bring your eye down? In India, they design a lot uh, with nature, bringing your eye in, getting your eye to travel to oh, certain parts of arrangements. Interesting. Very popular. Oh my goodness. And then I think we have another one that is actually, actually on top of the body that they're carrying to oh. the service. That is just, when earlier picture we saw with the strands of flowers, yes. that's tons of strands of flowers. Really? So different people within the community might make their strand for this loved oh. one and bring it. Isn't so here lovely? we would have what you think of as flowers on a casket, a casket yes. spray. There, yes. they have that extra added meaning that way. Uh, that is so meaningful. Yeah, it is. It is. Very meaningful. That, that, that's just lovely. Just lovely. All right, now we're going to talk about South America, Latin America. We do not have a picture to show, but we do have something to chat about there, right? Yeah, um, in those cultures, the Roman Catholic religion is very, very, um, like the majority are Roman Catholic and also Judeo-Christian. Judeo so a lot of their... Uh, 
you know, the things that they do culturally are similar to what we would do here. Um, however, they really personalize uh, funerals. So in a funeral arrangement, if a person was a gardener, for example, you might see their gardening gloves or the buckets that they use to haul soil or tools that they use to dig in the ground will be part of their sympathy flowers. Oh, really? They, yeah, they really, really personalize things. So uh, I'm a musician. I play, you know, drums. It's my favorite uh -huh. instrument, but also piano. So you might put my drumsticks Drum into the arrangement arrangement or yes. mallets that I would use on a xylophone or something. It's very, very personalized. So very similar to our culture, but very personalized. Okay. Another, and then you would be, become regional too. So in Mexico, when you go to a funeral uh, or we design in Mexican culture, and I've been to conferences where designers from Mexico will do uh, mm -hmm. seminars on their flowers, super colorful, <laughs> right? So I mean, if you've been yeah, to Mexico, you sure. see all the oh, colors. Yeah. They really bring that into the, their life also with flowers, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. very colored. Yes, that, that's wonderful, Gary. All right, one more picture we have and we will discuss the European culture. You know, in Europe, oh. flowers are an everyday part of life. Uh -huh. And if you've been to Lur yes, Europe, I was, in, I was in Europe just this last year, my daughter was studying there. Everyone's walking around with flowers, little $5 bouquets or $6 mm -hmm. bouquets. They have flowers at home all the time. It's a big part of their life. Unlike America though, they, and America's kind of changing a bit, but in, in Europe, if you send a flower arrangement, you don't send it in a vase. Oh. They're almost always just gathered flowers and the people arrange their own flowers and use flowers a lot. Oh, so I flowers see. are a big part of life. It's a gathering, it's a grouping. This would be something you would very often see in a funeral or yes. for a funeral in Europe. Um, this is a type of design where it, it tells a story a little bit. Uh, the family may have specifics that they put in the arrangement that tell a story, but it's a pillow and it's oh. for the deceased head to rest as so they oh. pass on to the next life. So, Isn't that yeah, so you see a lot of so this in, in that grouping of flowers in Pavane, and mm -hmm. it kind of just creates mm -hmm. a, yes. a outdoor yes. feeling. Well, the designing of those are spectacular. Isn't it amazing? It, it, it really is. It's fun. So, to watch. you mentioned funerals and in America, I think funeral flowers have changed so much over the years. Do, would they you have. agree with that? Yes. When I first started, for example, every time you went to a funeral, you saw what looked like funeral arrangements. Uh -huh. You know, they were fan-shaped, gladiolas, carnations. That is what you saw. Right. Today, it's very, very different. Today, mm -hmm. it's more of a celebration of life. Yes. So people will send flower, flowers loose and airy in a vase, something that somebody can take home and enjoy. It's more celebratory, less mm -hmm. sad. Um, mm -hmm. So if you go to a funeral today, you'll see everything. Okay. Um, yesterday I delivered a cross that I made out of birch branches oh. with flowers uh -huh. in it, oh. and also a little cube vase that was just a small little vase. You'd never used to see that at oh, a funeral. Wow. But you know, the, the one they'll probably leave at the graveside, the cross, the little one they'll take mm -hmm, home with them. Mm -hmm. So it's much I more like personal. I like that a lot. Yes, I like everyone that a does, lot. Yes. everyone does. Okay, Gary, before our time gets away from us, let's talk about the rose a little bit. You've okay. got some different roses and I did. kind of the meaning of the rose. I did, we started talking about we this, did. doing this through the meaning of flowers. We don't see it very often, but, but if you go online, you'll find different things for everything, like a red rose might be mean 20 different things. But some general ones that you can always know is, is a r rose, red rose is love. Okay. Um, so a lot of times that's why you see for anniversaries, somebody sends a dozen red roses. Sure. The ironic thing about that is a recent study done found that women especially loved, loved different colors of roses. Yes, they don't just like that. red. Yeah. So, you know, you want to maybe send a few along with other sure. colors. <laughs> the white rose is a rose that denotes purity. So you see mm -hmm. this so much in weddings. Yeah. Another reason you see it in the Asian culture and funeral arrangements, mm -hmm. it's very popular. Um, but today the fun thing is we get bicolor. So if you look to the very center yeah. of this rose, you can see, yeah. I don't know if we'll be able to get on TV, but there's a very blush pink. Isn't that gorgeous? Right. And pink is a sign of elegance. So this yeah. would be very appropriate for a wedding. That would be gorgeous. Here's a rose, another rose that's kind of both pink and white. It's much more open. I don't know how close that you can get to see the color with the lights, but this has the blush pink also. So this would be very appropriate so for a delicate. wedding, uh, for elegance. Uh -huh. So this would be great for a ballerina after oh, her yes. show there to you give go. her a rose I'll remember that. <laughs> I love orange and bright colors. As you probably can't tell that. I, yes. <laughs> so orange is a sign of hot passion. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so if you're dating, this might be a good color okay. rose, right? We're already point in life. But anyway, so I love the color orange, so <laughs> that's the most general meaning of of the color orange. And then real quickly, I wanted to bring a flower that people may not be familiar with. Okay. 
A lot of times people say, oh, flowers are fun, but they don't last a long time. The number one reason flowers don't last a long time is a lack of water, believe it or not. Yes. People forget to add yeah. water or change the water. This flower is called a campanula. You can see how it has all the bell shapes up and down the stem. This was picked in Ecuador 18 days ago. It's been in my shop Eight for 12 days. days. It was shipped for three days and then in my shop for 12 days. Really? Look how beautiful this is. This flower will last three to four weeks. It's a flower that we carry all the time. Fun, fun, fun. So you can have a very long lasting flower. Are they flower. come in different colors as they well? They come in purple, lavender, white, and pink. Okay, and the campanella. Campanella or campanula, campanula, you'll hear it That's pronounced. something I want to remember. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun flower. Well, Gary, you have, you have a fun story about a flower that wasn't so pretty. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> and we, we need to have a just very brief story okay. from you right. on that one. Well, I love tropical flowers. Okay. And um, this is called the Boing Boing flower. You can go to boingboing.com, B O I N G. B-O-I-N-G.com, boing, boing, and learn about this flower. How bizarre is that flower? <laughs> it it's is not strange. an avatar. They didn't make it for avatar. That's a real flower. <laughs> they could have used it. The next flower is um, one that I've, I've actually used before, and it's a hanging heliconia. And they come in many different beautiful colors, but this one's a little weird. Okay. In real, if you're looking at this in real life, it's hairy and it looks like a tarantula to me, oh. which I don't like. No. So it's very different. So flowers are odd also, not just beautiful. Okay, I understand. Well, Gary, can you imagine our world or our lives, for that matter, without flowers? No, I can't. I absolutely cannot. It makes me think of the Borg, uh, where oh. everything's gray and black and ugly. You know, I, <laughs> you know, I can't. I can't imagine a world without color. I can't imagine a world without love and friendship and joy. Yeah. And flowers denote all of those things. Um, I've delivered, in the 40 years I've been doing this, I've seen more smiles on people's faces when you bring them flowers. You wouldn't get that from a candle or a <laughs> balloon or a card. It just brightens a person's day. I, so I can't. I totally agree. I totally agree. Gary, thank you so much for being with us today. You're and welcome. thank you for cultivating beauty. Yes, you're welcome. We Thanks love for it. inviting me. <laughs> you are welcome. Okay. And to our viewers, thank you for taking time to smell the roses with us today. And always remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Hello, and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. Today we have three guests on Live and Learn, although only a couple of them are probably going to talk to you. Uh, a couple of them are going to break your heart. Well, maybe all three of them will break your heart. I'm not <laughs> sure. At any rate, uh, we have a very special guest. Um, it is the president and CEO of the Capital Humane Society, Bob Downey, is here. And we have a couple of, uh, we have a dog and a cat that we're going to talk to um, a little bit later. But um, thank you for being here. We really appreciate well, it. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Jerry. I always, I enjoy getting out and talking about Capital Humane Society and the work, and especially getting some of the adoption pets uh, out into the community so that people can see the quality of animals that they can get at the Pilot Pet Adoption Center. Excellent. Well, we'll see what we can do. Let's talk a little bit, I guess, about uh, you and the Capital Humane Society. Gosh, you've been uh, around for um, a long time, uh, really doing uh, really excellent things. Uh, you're involved in the city and you're helping in terms of legislation for animals, working with the legislature. Talk a little bit about how things have changed. Uh, I mean, you've been here about 30 plus years, I think. All right, yes, uh, January 30th, uh, 1984 at 7.55 a.m. is wow. <laughs> when I walked through the door of the Park Boulevard facility as, as the, the title was director at that time. And uh, they were, those were difficult times uh, for the organization. Uh, uh, and uh, are an example of what we've been able to accomplish over the, the last 30 plus years. Back at that time, uh, we employed a staff of 11 people, and we were taking approximately 10 and a half to 11,000 animals a year through the Park Boulevard facility. Wow. Uh, and today we employ uh, 33 to 34 people, and we're taking about 6,700 animals a year uh, through two facilities. And so uh, one of the biggest changes is just the resources that we have to work with. Uh, back in 84, we struggled to pay our bills. Uh, uh, today, we have a nice endowment 
that we're able to operate two facilities, we're able to have 33 to 34 professional staff, and I attribute that to the support of the community and to uh, very good board members we've been able to attract to the organization, good staff that we've been able to attract to the organization and to the volunteers. The other thing that has changed really significantly uh, uh, during that time period uh, is the attention that people pay to their local Humane Society today compared back to the mid-80s. The first conference I ever went to, I uh, heard people who had been in the uh, field talking about why don't people ever pay attention to us? And today I go to conferences and sometimes I hear people say things like, why do people pay so much attention <laughs> to us? But that's good, and yeah. it's good for the animals. And uh, the, the way the public pays attention to shelters today has resulted in a lot more shelter animals being saved in the communities those shelters operate in. Excellent, that's, that's good. You're in a sort of an interesting time of year right now, are you not? It is, it's a very busy time of year for us. And in our environment, uh, the intake of the organization fluctuates a lot. And when we get into December, January, February, March, the really colder months, we don't see as many pets coming through the shelter. And uh, I think pets instinctively uh, in the really cold weather uh, understand it's gonna, if they take off, it's gonna be harder to fend for themselves. And so they kind of hunker down and, and stay put. But in the summertime, uh, they're kind of like kids. You leave the back gate open. And uh, away they go. <laughs> away they go, headed to the beach or someplace like that. Uh, the other part of that is the volume of kittens that uh, we see this time mm. of year coming through uh, Capital Humane Society. And uh, with the outdoor, kind of the unowned cats that are in communities all across this country that are unsterilized, and they're producing uh, all the time. In the really, really cold weather, they don't come into heat on quite the same cycles, mm. and so we don't see as many kittens in there. So uh, the warm weather uh, brings more strays, brings a lot more kittens to the organization. And we've got one. You can probably hear it in the background uh, <laughs> wanting to come out and be a part of the show. We'll, we're going to have that in a little bit. And we should also remind everybody that uh, we have a phone number of the Captain Humane Society. We're going to keep flashing throughout the throughout the show. So if somebody is interested in being involved in some fashion, that, that number will be there. That's really an important part of your organization, uh, as I understand it, which is the volunteers. Yes. Uh, you have the 30-some full-time employees, which is fabulous, but um, there are lots of opportunities for, um, for people to get involved um, within the city, helping out animals, doing different kinds of things. So let's talk a little bit about the volunteer opportunities. I think one of the coolest, and I'm going to take this opportunity at some <laughs> point in time, is to be a dog walker. It is, and uh, actually it's the most popular uh, volunteer site of things with Capital Humane Society. So it's hard to accommodate everybody who wants to walk dogs. However, um, uh, we really encourage volunteerism with, with Capital Humane Society and we keep approximately 70 to 80 volunteers active a month with the organization. Some are for a short term and we have people who have volunteered with us for years and yes they do the dog walking we have volunteers who like to work with the adoption cats over mm -hmm. at the pilot pet adoption center helping to groom them and just exercising and playing games with them so on and so forth volunteers get involved in cleanliness of helping clean the facilities uh, lawn care with the facilities they get involved in fundraising activities we have uh, volunteers who work with visiting classrooms of children uh, oh. to the adoption center to talk to them about responsible pet care and uh, those types of things or volunteers who actually go out into classrooms and, and talk about the work of the Humane Society and how to properly care for pets and the importance of spaying and neutering. Uh, so there's just all kinds of things that volunteers get active in. Uh, when you call our phone number uh, and you go through the menu, and it's not a long menu, uh, we actually have a full-time director of uh, volunteers, Charlene Engberg, and uh, when people sign up uh, to volunteer with the organization, there's actually an orientation and training they have to go through. Yeah, I was going uh, to say, if somebody wants to get involved but says, gee, I don't really know a lot about some of this stuff, you will help them. Absolutely. And, and when it comes to the animal handling side of things, there's safety concerns. And so we want to equip 
volunteers with the information and the skills to keep themselves safe through their volunteerism with the shelter. But if it weren't for the volunteer program, I estimate we would need another seven to eight full-time employees uh, for the organization. So they do save the organization a lot of money that can go into other types of programs. Sure. And of course, one of the things that, uh, again, is very important is the, is the pet adoption. Let's talk a, at least a little bit um, about that and the involvement. What does it take to, to go sort of go through that process? If somebody's at least thinking about it. Well, we really encourage folks to, you can see some of the pets on our website, capitalhumanesociety.org. We don't have time to update it because we are moving new pets every day into the adoption program over at Pilot Pet Adoption Center. Um, uh, but we really encourage folks to come to the Adoption Center, which is located out on the southeast corner of 70th and Highway 2 in the Willowbrook Shopping Center out there. And our facility is actually right out on the corner, but you do have to go down 70th Street to access entrance in, into the Willowbrook Shopping Center. Um, uh, Take a look at the pets that are there for uh, for adoption, and it is cats and dogs primarily, but there are oftentimes other sorts of pets there. For instance, right now, Willie the rooster is over oh, there good. awaiting a new home, and uh, we see rabbits and gerbils, parakeets, uh, hedgehogs, all types of animals. Uh, I mean, if people have kept them as pets at some point uh, in this in this country, they do end up in animal shelters, unfortunately, right. Right. but uh, so you can look at shelters for those types of pets too. We try not to make it a really difficult process, but if you see something that you would like to interact with, our staff will help you. We have seven interaction rooms that can be going on all at the same time wow. over okay. at the Pilot cool. Pet Adoption Center. If you want to proceed with adoption of an animal, we've got questionnaires and so on and so forth. And they are questionnaires that are designed to send you away, Jerry. They are questionnaires that are designed to help you make a good decision in, in the whole process. And the adoption process probably takes in the range of 75 to 90 minutes, hour and 15 minutes to hour and a half. Uh, and you go home with a new pet. And well, let's maybe we, let's see if we can talk somebody <laughs> into one today. Uh, before we run out of time, I okay. want to I want to make sure that we uh, introduce everybody to um, this is Nala. Uh, tell us a little bit about Nala. Well, Nala is a white German Shepherd, four years of age, and was brought to Capital Humane Society by owners who were moving and unfortunately uh, were unable to take Nala with them. Uh, she's a very nice dog. Yeah. Uh, the information we have about her is she doesn't get along real well with adult cats. Uh, hasn't bothered the kitten that is with her today at all. And she's a little bit shy when she first meets new people and it's not an aggressive shyness or anything like that. It's just, you know, I need a little bit of time to get to know you. Yeah, and it didn't take very so, long, and she just uh, no. has settled down here and, uh, and taken a little nap. And, uh, and when she gets into a new home and has a few days to acclimate to a new home, somebody's going to have a fantastic pet. I actually think she uh, would do well in just about any situation. Obviously, if it was a home with really small children, you want to do some uh, controlling of real small children sure. interacting with a, do a new dog of this size, but right. uh, I think she will be fine. Uh, I'm going to slip over yeah, here for ahead a second. Yeah, go ahead and let's get the little kitten. The little kitten is just adorable. Several of the <laughs> folks around here were uh, having a great time uh, playing with... Uh, Mayokai. And, Mayo uh, and that's yes. M-A-O-K-A-I, I believe. And my understanding is, is that's a character in one of these video game oh, type okay. things. Oh, okay. I, and so I forth. wouldn't know that. But Mayokai, a uh, little male, about six to seven weeks of age, and uh, was brought to the shelter by Lincoln Animal Control, and no one came forward and claimed him. So he's been neutered and vaccinated, microchipped. We do a lot of things veterinary-wise at the Park Boulevard shelter for the pets before they are moved to the Pilot Pet Adoption Center. And Mayokai is just a lot of fun. Oh, yes. Uh, once he understands that he's got a little bit of liberty going on, he really starts showing off and playing and stuff. And it's just, kittens are actually, it's fun to adopt a kitten because you, through your interactions with the kitten and the family with their interactions with the kitten, can really have a lot to do with the personality that they develop for their lifetime. And a little guy like this, 17, 18, 19, 20 years of age is a right. reasonable yeah. expectation if Kep is an indoor pet uh, during its lifetime. And so uh, somebody is going to get 
a fun pet when they adopt this kitten. And Nala, we would really encourage that the name not be changed when she gets adopted because that has been her name and right. uh, it makes it confusing to change it. Mayo Kai, if you want to name him Steve or something like that, <laughs> you can go ahead. We can and go ahead so. and do that. Okay. <laughs> um, before we run out of time, because there is one other thing that I think you, you have coming up, uh, which is really important and it's really important and valuable to the organization, that is fundraising. And you have a special fundraising event that's coming up. We, um, we this, do. This Mark, Mark Pylock, who made just a very generous gift to make the Pylock Pet Adoption Center happen to our organization, is a collector of uh, classic muscle cars. And he is donating a 1969 Corvette convertible uh, okay. to Capital Thank Humane Society. It's going to be shipped up to Lincoln from Melbourne, Florida this month. And then July 31st, we're going to be having a press conference uh, that morning over at Deteau Chevrolet where the car is going to be displayed and we're going to start selling raffle tickets and we're going to sell uh, hopefully 1,070 raffle tickets at $100 a piece. The car is valued at $70,000 and some lucky winner is going to uh, have their name drawn on January 2nd and, uh, of 2018 and going to have a Corvette convertible. Wow, isn't that fabulous? <laughs> uh, we're out of time. Bob, I, I, I hope you'll come back and see us again. It's oh, always I'm fun to talk to you. It's always great to see the animals. And again, um, you do just such uh, fabulous work here in the city. Thank you for all you do. Well, thank you. And it's, a, it's a lot of people behind the scenes, too, a lot of the employees at the shelter that make it all happen. And oh, I'd be delighted to come back anytime. Fabulous. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching today. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake, and today we are going to fly with the angels. And we have one of the angels from the Angels Theatre Company. Thank you. Diane Gonzalez, <laughs> whom you probably have seen on Channel 5 time and time and time and time Too again. many times. But yeah. you are the board president of I the am. Angels. I should have worn my wings today. Oh. But oh. Yes, I am the board president of the Angels Theatre Company. And I also um, am fortunate enough to be cast in some of the productions. Well, also, you're the board of president, so you have uh, quite an involvement. Now, tell us about how did the Angels uh, Theatre Company, be, where did it start, where and how and when? Well, there are three founders of the Angels Company. Judy Hart mm -hmm. is still the heart and soul of the Angels. Uh, she and Pippa White and Sherry Cole got together, and they used to meet at the Greek Orthodox Church. And that church is full of angels oh. everywhere. And so someone at the meeting commented that they felt like they were in the presence of the angels. And that's how Angels Theatre Company got its name and that's how it stayed. <laughs> now, how, how long has it been then since it really, it actually began? Do you yeah, remember? Yeah, I think it was the early 90s. Oh, probably, that, that yes, long ago. Yes, yes, because I, I did, when I was at Channel 10, I did a story on their first production. Zeal, Grace, and Transformation. I need to dig that tape up and show it to Judy sometime. She'd get a kick out of that. The, the tape will still hold together and not fall it's apart VHS, after all that time? It's VHS, so I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, all of these shows are original shows written by local authors. So you got local actors, you got local authors. Well, where do you find the authors who can do these shows? Well, the first flight festival, which is in its third year, it grew out of the Angels Playwriting Collective. Mm -hmm. And the Angels, after they kind of lost their performing space, they decided to focus more on the playwrights and the, the literature of the theater. So a playwriting collective was formed. There are already some Angels members who were interested in writing plays. So this collective was born and they just started writing. They meet uh, once a month. It started in 2013. Um, they read plays to each other, they pitch ideas, now they these rework. Are the, these are ones that they have written themselves, they're original plays. Right, yeah. right. They're all original plays. So this, the playwriting collective then um, gets together and they go over the plays and rework them, but they can really write about anything they want. Oh! Uh, but for this performance, uh, for the Fleur First Flight Festival, they have to be 20 minutes or under, and they have to have the, somewhere the theme of family. Um, the Year of the Family is the theme for the Lincoln Theatre Alliance this year. 
uh, which the Angels is a member of. So, so the, the theme of family is carrying over into the First Flight Festival this year. So you can write anything you want within the framework of the family. It's got to be about right. the family. And on 20 minutes or under. Oh, right. and so some of them are really short, right? Some of them are short. Some of uh -huh. them are maybe three minutes. Um, some are, as, like the, we have some that are about 20. Um, but there are actually 15 plays that were selected for the festival. So you can imagine, Lita, that takes a lot of actors and directors to pull all that off. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be um, seven or eight plays in each flight. So there's two flights. And um, each show will be about two hours or less with an intermission. So it's a great variety. All right, and let's, let's take a look at some of the authors because they're, they're the creators. I mean, they have to come up with this to match whatever it's going to be. And so are these people paid or anything or do they do no, it for free? No, they, they do it for the love. Actually, they pay a membership fee to be members <laughs> of the collective. <laughs> but, um, but it's a small fee. Um, Paula Ray, is a, uh, you can see her on the, on the right in the middle there is Norm Simon. I did one of his plays last year. On the right there is Steve Anderson and I'm in one of his plays this oh, year. What, this will be play? the third play of Steve's that I've done. So. Um, the one I'm doing is there was something going on with you and Steve? <laughs> 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 Let's not tell his wife. Um, no, I actually um, was in Lowercase, a play that he wrote that was fully produced at the Playhouse. And this year I'm in a short play called Taxi Ride. Oh. And um, I play a part of a couple who is having a dispute on what to do for the evening. Uh, and um, Paula huh. Ray is directing that, but uh, Steve is a very creative and funny playwright, and um, so it's it's always a joy to do his work. Well, we have two of the actors with us uh, today, and maybe you introduce them, and we'll we'll show you one short segment. All right, this is called Baseball, and it was written by Steve Anderson, right? Okay, um, Mark Misarch is directing this, and our stars are Grandpa Harry, Harry Hafer. And Emerson Mickelson, also known as Emmy Mickelson, and this is a scene from baseball. Grandpa Steve. Yes, Maverick. Who invented baseball? Well, are you talking about the ball or the game? The game. Well, you know, I think I think God must have invented it. Grandpa Steve. No, really. It's in the Bible, so God must have invented it. It's not in the Bible. It is too, right smack on page one. Really truly? Really truly. The very first sentence says. In the big inning, God created the heaven and the earth. That doesn't mean baseball. Well, what else could it mean? You know of any other game that has innings? No. Well, neither do I. So, clearly, God invented baseball. Come on, Grandpa Steve. Who really invented baseball? <laughs> really, truly? Really, truly. Eh, nobody. Nobody? You mean it always was? No, not always was. Well, let me ask you this. Who invented people? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody? Where'd you get that idea? We evolved from other life forms. Whoa, they actually teach you that in school? A little bit, when we were studying dinosaurs, but mostly Dad told me. Well, your dad is pretty smart. Yeah. <laughs> almost as smart as your mother. What do you mean, almost? Well, your mother is my daughter, so naturally she has to be the smarter one. Oh, naturally. Prettier, too. Well, that's true. But neither one is as smart as I am. Says who? Well, I know where baseball came from. Bet they don't. So where did it come from? Well, it evolved like people. How could it evolve? It all started with the bat family. Bats? The flying creatures? No, humans. You know, last name spelled B-A-T-T. -T. You're making this up. I am not. R2. Well, I don't know all the details, but some family, and I call them the Bat Family, took the very first steps on the evolutionary trail of baseball. What steps? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Bat had a large family of girls. Just girls? Just girls. Yes! And those girls, all four of them, were growing up to be good, well-behaved, hard-working, hard-studying citizens. But when the youngest girl was midway but through... what? Well, when she was halfway through middle school, Surprise! Mrs. Bat got pregnant again in several nine. months. Nine. It takes nine months. <laughs> All right, nine months. Nine months later, boom, she gave birth to twin baby boys. Oh, so boys invented baseball? No, now don't make assumptions. Don't get ahead of the facts. Okay, what are the facts? Well, with a family of all girls, they finally had some boys, and the whole family tried to protect them from wolves and bears and such, and they treated them pretty special. So they got kind of spoiled. Were they bad? No, not bad, really. Just 
full of mischief, curious and into everything. Was I like that as a baby? Oh, you were far worse, let me tell you. You were the most curious kid I've ever seen, pulling everything out of everywhere. You could wreck a nice clean house in seven seconds flat. Huh. You used to drive your parents crazy. No, you weren't as you weren't as spoiled as the Bat Boys, that's for sure. That's funny. There were Bat Boys before there was baseball. <laughs> Didn't those people did a nice job? Wonderful, the little girl yes. and her grandpa. That was really good. She's got quite a future as an actress, yes. I think. Yes, and He's I think the old guy too is going <laughs> to go, go somewhere. Harry's pretty good too. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you realize that um, the Angels Theater Company won the Mayor's Arts Award on June the seventh of this month. So let's let's take a watch. Well, you're going to see us walking to the stage here to get the award. That's our, um, the Lincoln Arts Council puts on this event, and that's Dwayne Taylor there, our, who was our MC for the evening. Uh, Christy Wilcox there on the right is the president of the Lincoln Arts Council, and of course that's Mayor Beitler in the middle. So here we are coming up to get the award. That's me. I'm followed by Pippa White. And there in the hat is Mark Misarch. <laughs> I thought there was a cat in the hat. <laughs> the theme for the night was the Wizard of Arts. So <laughs> that's what that's all about. But um, uh, the Angels Theater Company has won the Mayor's Arts Award before uh, for several productions, including The Train and In My Daughter's Name. But this year, the Angels were recognized as the arts, as the arts organization. And that really meant a lot to us to be recognized as an organization. Um, I think Judy said um, that the, the Angels organization itself is a work of art. Now, we want to give you the details. If you've got a pencil, you might want to jot some of these things down as because they're going to be coming up very soon. Why don't you tell us, All Diane? right, the Angels Theatre Company's third annual First Flight Festival. It's coming up July, July 19th through the 29th. And you'll want to check the um, Angels Company website there because the times and the dates do vary a little bit. That's angelscompany.org. All of the plays are performed at the Studio Theater, which is in UNL's Temple Building. That's the older building that's just east of Do you know that that's the, the oldest league. building on the campus? It's a beautiful building, it, it really and, is. And thanks to Johnny Carson, who donated millions of dollars to refurbish it. If you haven't been to the Temple Building, a lot of people get con confused because there's, there are two Johnny Carson theaters. Right. The Johnny Carson at the Temple Building, which is at 12th and R, and across the street at... Um, the lead center is another Johnny Carson, right. so don't get them confused. That's right, and make sure you check the website because we have the performance, semi like I said, varies a little bit, and there's also a couple of afternoon performances as well. So, And there's two flights, so you want to make sure you get to see both of the flights so you can see the great work that's being done by our local playwrights and our local actors. And all done for free. All done I mean, for everybody's free. everybody's donating. The writers, the directors, the actors, the performers. It, it's just really very, very special. Well, one thing that makes this so appealing for the actors is being able to work with the playwrights. Because mm -hmm. that doesn't happen very often mm -hmm. with many plays. You don't actually get to meet the playwright. And in this case, sometimes they're right there in the room. So it's very exciting. Thank you, Miss Gonzalez. Thank nice you, Miss Lita. You again yes, you too. Break a leg. Thank no, you. No, wait, no, don't, no, don't break anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that term, I know where the term came from, but I, I hate to, I did that once. I broke a leg and that wasn't funny. Well, that's not funny. No. But we, yes, everybody does a great job. It's a lot of fun, a lot of variety, and I hope yeah. everybody can come and enjoy the first flight. <laughs> and remember, it's never too late to live and learn more about quality theater in Lincoln, Nebraska. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. You just heard a fun little rendition of Soldier's Joy there by the Toasted Ponies. And uh, one of the members of the Toasted Ponies is with us today. His name is Steve Hansen. And Steve, welcome to the program. It's just a delight to have you here. Yeah. Um, I think almost everybody in town knows you or has heard you play at, at some point in time. Uh, fabulous musician. And uh, again, thanks for being wow. with us today. Thanks for having me, Jerry. I've uh I appreciate that, and I'll send that back at you, too, because uh, I like your playing a lot, too. Oh, thank you. We've had the opportunity to 
get to know each other for years now, right? Yes, we're uh, actually going to play a couple of songs today, yeah. and it's. I was thinking the other day that it's. Uh, it's been fun because I get to play with you all the time, but I can't remember when we ever play a whole song together. <laughs> so <laughs> well, we sort of play a little bit yeah, here, a little, a little bit, bit here, there, a little so, bit uh, there, and. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it's been years, right? Since uh, it we've has, yeah. It's met been each years other. since but, we played together. So, but I yeah. admire your playing, and and uh, it's fun to be able to do this. So yeah, good. Thank, thanks for having me. Well, let's talk about you. Um, <laughs> okay. um, again, you um, people are going to get a chance to see um, really what it is that you can do, and that uh, that really is fun. But um, I always think of you as sort of a musician's musician. It's uh, you have lots of interesting opportunities, but you also you play for an aging partners function. Uh, you play at a number of the retirement homes uh, around town, yeah. which is fabulous. Yeah. Uh, I think it just must come from a love of music that you have. Um, well, I like those particular gigs. Uh, I like the legacy gigs, and uh, whenever we go out on the road and play, we do arts council shows in small communities, we always offer them a, uh, a nursing home uh, retirement village. We'll go out there and play for free. We'll just do it for fun. And I, I actually like it. You get to meet these people and they're real appreciative. And so, yeah, and, uh, and it's fun to play for an audience like that. I have a good friend who uh, has seen you play on any number of occasions. And he said the one thing that always strikes him is, is that it always looks like you're having the absolute best time when you are playing. Is that yes, really well, true? Yes, well, it takes a lot of work to look like that, <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, I mean, at that point, it, it should be fun. Yeah. I mean, once you've gone through all the practice, you've hauled the equipment, you've set everything up, the actual playing, when you're really playing, you're not announcing a song, or when you're actually playing, that should be fun. If it's not, you know, yeah. there's no there's reason no to, to, be out there. To, to do it, really. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there's not a, as you and I both know, there's not a whole lot of profit in this. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so you better enjoy it. Sure. And, and uh, for the most part, I do. Good. Let's talk about how it all got started. You, you have had um, really fabulous success, uh, not only playing the banjo, playing the guitar, playing the mandolin. Um, in all different kinds of music, but let's talk about how it all sort of got started. You were a, a young man and all of a sudden something made yeah. you decide that you wanted to pick up the guitar and play? Uh, yes, that's a, a good question. Um, I was about 13 and I had a couple friends, uh, Bruce McGee and Stan Ewing, and they, they kind of wanted, this was the end of the folk craze, the folk scare, 1963, and they wanted to start a folk band. And uh, they knew I had a guitar, but I'd, I'd never played. I think it, was, it belonged to my brother, and, but it was just in the closet. And so, so I got the guitar out, and uh, my sister had bought this book of uh, Beatles. The Beatles had just come out, the Meet the Beatles, first their first. And there was a musical folio that was produced for that. And on the back of that, were about, I don't know, a dozen chords right. or something. Right, I had the book. You had the book, yeah. so I, I, I learned those dozen chords, and boom, I joined, started playing in this band, and, uh, and, and the rest is, well, Yeah, and then it, sort of, it sort of evolved into bluegrass. Where did the bluegrass uh, sort of come into that and, and sort of picking up the banjo? Sure. Because, uh, Again, it's it was that was sort of a time when it was sort of rebellion, rock and roll craze, all of those kinds yeah, of things, well, and you sort of drifted in yes, a little bit of a different direction. But I think it came through that that folk background a little bit because you know they these folk acts, uh, you know the Terriers and uh, Brothers Four and the Kings Trio, they usually had a banjo player that you know didn't do a lot, but and so I'd see that. And then I, I kind of went back to try and figure out where these songs had come from. And that led me into bluegrass. Um, I had to have a good friend, Terry Schmidt, that, and he was interested in the same kind of thing. So we both explored that end of it. And, uh, and he, I uh, started picking up on the, the banjo. It seemed like a technically difficult thing to do, which uh, I liked that idea. You know, that yeah. I, I could work on it for a long time and maybe never get it and, and or, or continue to get better my entire life. Yeah, there's my, a nice picture of you as a young man. 
playing the banjo? Oh yeah, that's that's this banjo, by the way. It is. Yeah, yeah. And you've had that a long time. I've had that a long time. Bought it in '70. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. 1975, I think, is when I acquired this banjo. But my parents were both, they, they neither of which played bluegrass. My brother was a rock player, you know, and so I don't, I don't know if my parents, I don't, <laughs> I think they wondered what the heck I was doing. But both being musicians, I think they respected the idea that I was kind of you know, exploring different things. And I kind of came back to what they played, too, uh, in later years. Yeah, yeah, so. well, I, we want to talk about the jazz a little bit later, but uh, when, you know, when did it sort of click in for you that you went, you know, this, this maybe is not just an avocation, yeah. but maybe it, it's possible that it could be a vocation? Well, you know, when I was 13 or 14, my main motivation was, you know, I'd, I wanted to get invited to parties and oh, meet sure. girls and and I thought this might be a good way to do that somewhere in the back of my mind. So I was not thinking about art or thinking about a career or th thinking about anything other than having fun. Right. And you know so that I started teaching a little bit and um, kind of enjoyed that and got a, a little more success and pretty soon I, I started working much harder at the craft and trying to get better and better and, and realize that, uh, you know, maybe there, there might be a chance that I could actually make a living at this yeah. and, and maybe even create something that people might actually want to hear. Yeah. Well, and speaking of wanting to hear, um, b before we get too far away yeah. and we run out of time, yeah. uh, and if people have not had a chance to, to hear you play, um, Let's give them a chance. All right. Um, let's, let's let's play at least a little bit of a of a bluegrass. Okay, song here. we'll take a we'll play a short version, but uh, let's do that Cripple Creek song. Okay. And that was a uh, I learned it from Earl Scruggs, the great banjo player, uh, years ago. One of the first songs I learned actually. So it goes something like well, actually, it goes exactly like this. Lots of fun. Um, it is fun. Talk about some of the uh, people that you've had a chance to uh, play with. Uh, that's sort of an uh, interesting part of your career. Um, you've had a chance to sort of go on the road a little bit and uh, yeah, do some fun um, things. Y you actually sent me sort of a list of questions and that you might ask, mm -hmm. and, and I, I tried not to look at them actually because. <laughs> I didn't really, well, I'd rather yeah. have it be more spontaneous. And, but I did kind of look at that one and I thought about that one a little bit. And, and I have had the opportunity to play with some of the, you know, Jimmy Martin, Bill Monroe, a couple of the bluegrass greats. I, I had the chance to jam with Mark O'Connor, who's played the lead down here. Mm -hmm. I played uh, uh, with the great uh, C.W. McCall. Yeah, C.W. McCall, Bill, that's a... It was kind of fun. It was kind of fun. Uh, Bill Freeze is his actual name, and uh, through him, uh, Chip Davis, the uh, Fresh Air guy, was the band director at the time, and he also did. Uh, uh, he played drums in the band, and a uh, pretty good drummer and a great 
musician, it was fun to inter interesting to, to observe how he arranged songs and things like that. Um, so, but you know, a lot of the people that I, I played with that I think are tremendous players, no one would, hardly anybody would know. Right. Uh, I played, one of my, got a chance to play with Bob Letterly. You know, people, rest in peace. Uh, yeah. he, he was one of the greatest banjo players, a huge influence on me. You know, it's relatively unknown. Um, people like uh, Sean Benjamin. Right. You know, great, another great player, rest in peace. Uh, Dave Troop played with him. He sure. was a, a drummer with the Eccentrics back when. And uh, yeah, he, so a lot of these people and a lot of people that I play with now, you know, uh, yeah, it's everyone it's I play with. A lot with. of great musicians. Like yeah, it. a lot of great musicians. And I've just had the opportunity, you know, for whatever reason to be around some of these really great players and I would include all my bandmates and uh, and uh, pick up gigs that I play Jimmy Williamson and uh, you know some other I, sure. I can't go down that path right there's just I, so many there's just so many all. but 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 that those you know that that's those people have been huge influences on me and they may or may not be they're not big names, you know. No, but really uh, excellent musicians. Yeah, right. yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the jazz because that's uh, is sort of, um, I mean, it has some sort of interesting relationships to, to bluegrass, and um, but it, it really is sort of a, a different kind of a thing. You, you yeah. got into that. What was the sort well, of the motivation behind um, that? Well, my, my dad played uh, swing and jazz, and so I'd grown up listening to it and, uh, you know, always liked it. And... Uh, but I thought, you know, it was a little beyond my grasp. I, it was just really difficult to do, and still is. I don't even, I won't, don't consider myself a jazz player at all. I'm just working at trying to be that. But I, I love it. I spend more of time working on that than probably anything. It may not show exactly, but, <laughs> but I do. I spend a lot of time uh, on that, and I'm, I'm picking up more and more gigs. Uh, doing that so good and you had a little jazz trio for a while and it's now sort of morphed into um, a different kind of a little three-piece yeah I've got uh, the, the lightning bugs with uh, Reynold Peterson and Jim Pfeiffer and uh, and we we play the uh, aging partners dinner and a show we've done that a couple of years now and they they like us a lot that's yeah, <laughs> good <It's> <laughs> So uh, it's a fun little band, and it's an outlet for me to get to play some of those tunes and and songs that I heard my father play, actually. Yeah. You've had lots of, of great success and had lots of opportunities. What is it that keeps you here? I mean, it's uh, I'm always sort of amazed that uh, well, I'm we have such uh, talented people, but they end up sticking around. <laughs> I'm a total homebody. <laughs> That's my personality. Uh, if I could, I'd just stay home all the time. <laughs> Some might say antisocial, but I think that's a, going a bit too far. I, I just, uh, I, I like Lincoln. I've lived here all my life. It's, a, it's an easy town to get around. It's just, and it's been really good for me. If I went someplace else, like now, you know, think about, it. you know, I'd have to go to jam sessions and I'd have to be knocking on doors, right. and, and you know, it would just be a lot of work. And I could have done that, you know, 35, 40 years ago, right. but, but... You didn't I, seem to have much interest in it. Not, not a lot. I didn't really even like playing on the road that much. Yeah. Uh, the few times that I did it, it seemed like, uh, <laughs> you know, it'd be like t an hour of, of terror or fun, however you want to look at it, with, uh, you know, 36 hours of boredom. Right, right. Yeah. You know, of just sitting around and I couldn't do anything. I wasn't home, you know. Sure. Right. So a lot of my hobbies are, are you know, yeah. sort of home oriented. Right. <laughs> We're going to run out of time. We're not going to okay. have time to, to play our jazz tune. Which Could we is, play it out? Which is uh, too bad. Well, we might in a minute. Give me, I guess, a quick, what, what's the future hold? Do you have a fun okay, answer I, for that when I say, I, well, you're, you've done some... You've done some teaching, you've done some recording, you've done some playing. Uh, where, where are you headed now? Okay, you? well, I have really no exit strategy. But if I, if I were to retire, 
I would probably do some teaching, probably do a little, some gigs, probably do a little producing and recording. Right. <laughs> Not much different than <laughs> that. It's exactly what I do now. <laughs> I might, I'm, I'm definitely slowing down a little bit. I won't take every gig that comes around. Right. Uh, I'll leave that to you. Sure, <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, um, delighted that you're here. Well, delighted that you're here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, still out there playing well, and uh, glad to doing be here. fabulous things. Um, thanks so much. We will. Yeah. We'll take it out with a little autumn leaves, but okay. I do want to remind everybody that it is, of course, never too late to live and learn. <laughs>